<laughs> Rick Dublin is the, uh, is the executive director at uh, the Multidisciplinary Association of uh, Psychedelic Studies. Rick Dublin, stand up, Rick, say hello to the people. Right on. And we also have Bob Granfield. Uh, Bob, you want to stand up? He's a professor of uh, sociology and director of the Civic Engagement and Public Policy, Policy Initiative at the State University at New York, uh, uh, of New York at Buffalo. Uh, Bob, thanks for being here with us. Uh, Lynn Paltrow, uh, my dear friend from New York, she is the founder and executive director of the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, thank you for being with us, Lynn. Um, we also have uh, Sue Sisley, right? Is Sue here today? No? She's out. She's out? She'll be here. She'll be here. Okay. But we do have uh, Shaquita uh, 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 Borman, right? Uh, she is the director of, of program development for women with a vision and community-based organization of black women providing HIV, AIDS, and substance abuse prevention services and resources to communities of color. Yeah, yes. uh, community of color is to address individual risk, behaviors, and social vulnerability in New Orleans. Right on. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. Uh, Sheila, is that how we say it? Yes, Sheila, okay. yes. Sheila Murphy is the, the senior scientist. She's a senior scientist at the Institute for uh, Scientific Analysis uh, in San Francisco, California. Thank you for being here. All right. So the first question that I like to propose, I like to pose to folks, and Lynn, I'd like you to answer the question first. Um, <laughs> Because Lynn uh, today was on the front page of the New York Times. Yes. Front page of the New York Times. Um, I guess. And I'm going to have to get off the stage and do an interview and come back. It's not just because I was on the front page of the New York Times. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Then, well, you didn't say that. Okay. All right. Uh, Lynn, the question that I have to ask you is um, in your experience, uh, your knowledge. How do you see, in terms of uh, how uh, politics might influence what gets studied and what gets published? You know, I sort of feel like you're, 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 I've learned so much from you about that. Um, I've learned so much from you, Carl Hart, and from my colleagues at DPA. Uh, as, as you well know, we have a National Institute on Drug Abuse, not a National in Institute on Drugs, and so there's an inherent bias in what kind of research gets studied. Uh, in the particular intersectional work I do, which is the intersection of the war on drugs and uh, efforts to end uh, not only abortion, but I think the status of women as full and equal persons, targeting particularly women of color, uh, there has been enormous alarm and repeated misinformation about uh, drug use during pregnancy and its effects. And we know that there was, oh, sorry. We know that there was a study in Lancet that found that if you had a study that um, uh, claimed to find a relationship between prenatal drug exposure and harm, uh, you were, I think, 75 times uh, more likely to be published than if you had an article that was unable to find a connection between prenatal exposure to drugs, even if your study not finding those um, associations or causations was uh, a much better study. So we see enormous bias there. And we just see enormous bias in the sense of, um, I, think, I think there's a whole, there, there are a couple of issues. One is, even when we do have science, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to win the day. People can ignore it when, and we know that they ignore cost-benefit analysis and so forth. Um, we also, I think there, it's important to think about what groups of people do we think of as not deserving of science. So in cases involving pregnant women, there's, also, there's often the notion that everybody knows what pregnant women ought to do. So you can just ask the sheriff or uh, the, the, the nurse who's done no research or the general practitioner who's done no research what they think. But we see, and we see this notion that they don't deserve, um, they are not fully human, not fully entitled to having decisions about them, policies about them based on actual science or research. And we also see that in the social sciences, which is where I will end. Uh, there is an assumption wild, widely held 
uh, and very much enforced in the civil child welfare system, that if you know a parent has used a drug, you can also know they are more likely to abuse their child. Uh, there's an entire sub-SAMHSA agency on uh, drug abuse and child welfare. And as far as I can tell, there is no evidence-based <coughs> research to support those assumptions. And it has been very, very hard to find anybody anywhere willing to really do the research to find out whether we can tell from a cup of urine whether somebody can parent, whether they love their children, whether they're at greater risk of hurting their children. As we heard in the opening plenary, for some people, using drugs is the thing that makes them better parents. So I hope that research will be done. And the final thing is, we do, we have groups of people who are the third rail, even in our own community. I've heard that term used so that people who are looking at the question of what benefits might marijuana have for people and what strains work better for people, including pregnant women and the value of marijuana for extreme morning sickness, third rail. What happens around pregnant women breastfeeding with, and while they're using marijuana, third rail. We don't want to touch it, we don't want to ask it, but if we're going to have a human rights movement, if we're going to include everybody, they have to be eligible for that research too. They have to be part of the scientific inquiry and thought of as deserving enough to be part of it. Can you pass the microphone to Rick and Rick, if you could answer that question as well? <clears throat> In terms of how science or politics, uh, politics might influence the science that you're concerned about? Yeah, well, um, the, the nonprofit organization that I run, MAPS, is essentially a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to develop psychedelics and marijuana into FDA approved prescription medicines. And part of the reason we're doing that is that there is a um, market failure, you could say, in that these are all drugs that are off patent that the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in developing. So there's two basic aspects of it. One is regulatory approval, and then the other is funding. And so from the point of regulatory approval, there was a period um, of incredible research with psychedelics, uh, beginning in the 40s, really blossoming in the 50s and 60s. And then it was shut down, not just in the United States, but all over the world, to the point where there was absolutely no research where humans were being given psychedelics or marijuana in a clinical context. And that was an arbitrary decision on the basis of FDA and other regulatory agencies that the risks were too great, not just the risks of these drugs used in the studies, but the social risks of the reporting about the results of the studies. And so from that, it took 20 years about for the FDA to reverse themselves, starting in 1992. And what happened was that a new group of people took over regulating psychedelics and marijuana in 1990. And they decided that they wanted to put the science first. And they were able to do that. And in 1992, they had an advisory committee meeting to ratify whether that would be their official policy once we started trying to move to studies about the benefits of these drugs in patient populations. And that meeting was attended by people from the drug czar's office, people from NIDA, people from FDA, people from DEA. And what FDA did, it was a brilliant kind of maneuver in that they said that um, they wanted to open the door to this research, but they would take the same standards that they used for evaluating pharmaceutical company drugs by for-profit companies, and they would apply those to these drugs. And those procedures and the cost of those studies seemed so large to all the, the DEA and IDA people there that they figured if that's the FDA policy, Nothing's ever going to get out the other end. So they were able to get that adopted, and neither DEA nor NIDA nor the Drug Stars Office had any special review process over the protocols. But what, the, what they didn't realize is that because these drugs are heavily demonized, the governments over the world have spent enormous sums of money trying to find out what's wrong with these drugs. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars has been spent, and all of that research is in the public domain. So actually, it is possible for us to move through the FDA to make these drugs into medicines. And because the FDA is the leading agency in the world for this kind of work, once we got permission in the United States, regulatory agencies around the world would follow suit. So right now, there's more psychedelic research going on than at any time in the last 40 years. And it's just continuing to grow. And there are no real regulatory obstacles in the place of doing this research and expanding it except for medical marijuana. Marijuana is the exception. There is no research going on anywhere in the world 
where somebody is explicitly trying to make the marijuana plant in smoked or vaporized form into a prescription medicine. There's a lot of research trying to isolate cannabinoids in non-smoking delivery systems. And the way that this is enforced is through this peculiar historical anomaly that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana that can be used in research. So despite all of the incredible uh, complexity and sophistication of the medical marijuana growers in Colorado and California and all the other states and all the laboratory analysis that they do of their product, that none of that is qualified for use in FDA-approved clinical trials because it doesn't have a DEA license for the initial steps of growing it. So that the only place in the world right now where people in the United States could get marijuana for research is from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And in 1999, they, uh, HHS put out a policy that described how privately funded <coughs> studies would have access to this kind of marijuana. And what they explicitly said is that if you want to make the marijuana plant into a medicine in smokable form, this marijuana is not for you. It's only if you want, and they, they sort of prejudged the idea that marijuana caused lung cancer, that the FDA would never let something through. What we know now is that marijuana does not cause lung cancer, and there's a very likely chance that a rational risk-benefit analysis would approve marijuana as a prescription drug for a lot of different things. We tried for uh, 12 years to sue the DEA to get our own farm with a DEA license, and we. Don't give, a, don't give away too much yet. Uh, we're we're going to ask what to do oh, oh. in response. <laughs> All right, so then uh, let me just go back to then the funding part. So the other part of this is um, where does the funds come from for this research? Most of the funds come from the National Institute of Health or from pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies aren't interested. So the idea of nonprofit drug development is very new. The first is, is kind of the, the first non the first drug that made it through, <coughs> sponsored by a nonprofit organization, was the abortion pill, RU46, approved by the Population Council in 1999. So now the Gates Foundation and others are supporting nonprofit drug development for drugs for Africa, for various parasites, things like that. In Europe, in general, with higher taxation, more socially oriented countries, people don't give to charities as much. In the United States, we have more of a nonprofit sector. So the only organizations that are raising money to support psychedelic and medical marijuana research are nonprofit organizations in the United States. And we're limited by the funds that we have, but we're um, increasingly having contacts with wealthier people, and our pilot data is promising, and that's helping. So we're trying to break down these barriers to get NIH funding from the National Institute of Mental Health for MDMA research for post-traumatic stress disorder, but NIDA will not fund research into the benefits of marijuana. They're there to look at what are the risks of marijuana. So the funding is what's the primary limiting factor right now, and I think that's going to be changing over time. Thank you. Can you pass it to Shakira for sure? Um, so I think in terms of you know how politics um, kind of affect this idea of research. So looking at it from the perspective of a new researcher and one who works primarily in a community-based setting, um, I think part of the issue is, uh, you know, these kinds of politics decide a lot about who we research, um, how we're, you know, remiss um, in this country to really discuss race, um, you know, our racial bias. But this is a community that, in terms of African Americans, that we're constantly going to, to research um, to the point where, you know, it becomes difficult for them, where we as researchers tend to go into the community, kind of take resources, not leave very much behind. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue across the board. Um, I think, for instance, Women with Vision, we actually just did a project that we worked on with LSU, and part of the issue that we had there was you know, really getting the point across that, you know, these populations, I mean, they have the least amount of power really to kind of, you know, drive our research objectives, but, you know, and, and continually going back to them, you know, we assume that, yeah, they're gonna be there and they're gonna be available for us, but I think as research, we just really need to um, do a little bit better the way we, you know, handle that and the way we consider race politics uh, around research. 
Hi, uh, I'm Sheila Murphy, uh, and I'm going to come at this question from a little differently. I uh, have been on federal welfare for the past 35 years. Uh, I've been receiving grant money, um, and when I don't have it, I don't pay my mortgage, um, and I, you know, have a, a different kind of life. Right. So I, um, I'm very thankful to all the people who uh, allow me to come into their communities and. Um, to research. One of the things I think that I think is really basic to this to the question that we're asking here is language. We can't, it's not our language. We don't we don't even get to use this language. We're not even the language of science, frankly. Um, we it was, it was maybe 15 years ago that NIDA had a nomenclature that said you could talk about drug abuse, but not drug use. That controlled drug use didn't exist. <laughs> That, that they, they literally, it was sort of, you know, was, it was religious in its nature. This is God and this is not. And there is no controlled drug use. Um, so it's as basic as that. Wait, who, who had that? Nomenclature? The National Institute on Drug Abuse. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. I, I, it, was, it was a good 15, 20 years ago. No, and it was, it was literally, people, people that were writing grants were very clear about the fact that you did not write a grant saying, I want to study controlled marijuana use, for example, because it would never see the light of day. So it's language, the very, our, the questions we can ask, anybody that, all of us have studied the scientific method at one point, the questions we can formulate in our very minds are controlled by, uh, by the language that, that we are um, ghettoized in, so, so, so to speak. So that, I think that that's one of the ways we need to understand this problem, is that we can't even think in ways that, uh, uh, that differ from the, the, the common belief or the belief of the so-called uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse. I, I just, I just want to say something about that. Well, one of the things that Sheila is pointing out, the National Institute on Drug Abuse's mission is to focus on, or it says something like, bring the, na the nation's uh, resources to bear on the problems of drug abuse and drug addiction. So that's a sort of narrow focus in terms of, uh, it's a National Institute of Health uh, organization. So the National Institute of Health focuses on pathology. That's true. Now, one of the things that when we think about this language is that if you make a compelling case, for example, right. that you should be studying some other than right. pathology, you certainly can make that compelling case, but the problem is, is that you have to educate the researchers themselves because oftentimes they are un operating under the misapprehension that there is no uh, particular controlled use. But, if, but you can work to do the education, so I just want people to understand that. These are scientists, ultimately, even though they may be biased, but if you are, uh, uh, make a compelling case, it, it, you make a compelling case. Uh, thank you. My name is Bob Grantfield, and I'm at uh, SUNY Buffalo. My, my experience with this um, is from the context of a, a university environment, which, like Sheila, I've been involved in, in lots of grants. Um, and to follow up on just this point about language, it is very important to understand the role that language plays as a form of politics in influencing uh, drug research. A lot of research that I have done is in the whole phenomenon of natural recovery, overcoming without treatment. Currently on the NIDA's website, in their discussion of treatment, they list a variety, which NIDA tends to be intervention-based. This is a bias within NIDA. It's intervention-based. So on the current website, when it talks about treatment, they list a variety of different interventions, including self-help approaches as well. But in the introductory statement, they actually have this statement that basically says a lot of people try to overcome on their own, but this is part of the denial of the disease of alcoholism or the denial of the disease of addiction. So right in their website, they are denying the most common pathway by which people overcome addiction, namely spontaneous remission or natural recovery. So I think that that is a critical example of how politics, this, right, if you come into a NIDA situation with a, with a proposal uh, and to, to try to convince the reviewers, which is the kind of the, the door to access the funding, 
Um, that is that there is an op opportunity for to, to do that, but the institutional challenge is is tremendous. When I have and my colleague who's in the back, Will Cloud, when we were doing our research on natural recovery right here in Denver, uh, it was very difficult. Many of the reviews that we got back from NIDA applications suggested that they didn't even believe the concept of natural recovery was possible. Right? So they're entering into their scientific review of our research proposal with a bias that might affect the degree to which we will be funded. So that's one example, I think, of how um, politics certainly uh, plays out. But there's certainly politics in other institutions as well. Uh, one of my grants, grants in the past was through SAMHSA. This was a prevention grant that um, through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. And I was out uh, giving a a presentation with some SAMHSA people, and I actually used the term harm reduction. <laughs> and I was pulled aside after that and basically told, oh, no, no, you cannot use that language. So language is being controlled. So this idea of objective free research, uh, language was uh, being controlled in, in many ways. Um, the last, two other quick examples uh, one, uh, again, United States, and another, we have to think about this in terms of uh, international um, issues as well. Um, it's important to recognize that every grant proposal that goes out of a university, that university has to sign a declaration that they have signed on to the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. Now, most universities just check it off. They don't even think about this. But the politics are very, very real and implicit. If I get a grant from NIDA, or if I get a grant from NIH, and one of my students is arrested for drug use or drug possession, which is entirely possible, <laughs> um, we stand the risk of losing our funding because we would not be in compliance, necessarily, with the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. So there are policies in place that have significant implications. And we have to think about this also from the work that we do on the international front. So I have, I have been going to Singapore in the past few years uh, teaching courses. We have this association, we have this relationship with Singapore. Uh, we give degrees through the University of Buffalo in Singapore gone there a couple occasions to teach, and I've actually taught courses on drug policy. And it's very interesting because if you know anything about Singapore, if you've gone there, right in the embarkation papers, it says, you know, drug traffickers will be executed. Not maybe, not could be, will be. You know, it leaves no, no uncertainty whatsoever. And when authorities discovered within the university that I was teaching a course on drugs and society, I was talked to, I was contacted, and I was told by people at the university that it's one thing to talk about drug issues in the U.S. context and to talk about drug policy from the U.S. context, but not to bring up challenges to drug policy in Singapore. So it's important to understand that this is not just a local, or just not a nationalist, this is a global international phenomenon in which the work that we're all doing is being uh, constrained at many levels. Oh, sure. Uh, my name's Sue Sisley. I'm a physician from Arizona. I had the good fortune of teaming up with Rick Doblin a few years ago to start doing marijuana research sponsored by his nonprofit organization, MAPS. And I have become keenly aware of how politics intrudes on research now. I'd say probably the three biggest barriers we've run into uh, politically are first the one that Rick outlined so eloquently that this NIDA monopoly is very onerous. You know, if, uh, if NIDA refuses to sell you study drug, you know, to, to a group of investigators, that, that study will not be implemented. And so that's, you know, obviously the biggest hurdle to overcome initially. But we've run into two other um, huge barriers also, which is 
simply finding a home for this research is really complicated. Um, one of the problems we saw was that uh, when, when he was mentioning the Drug-Free Workplace Act, in Arizona, our universities decided to be in compliance with this act that they were going to ban marijuana on all campuses, and thus they shut down any potential to do marijuana research. And so we had to run a bill in our legislature this last session to try to allow, you know, to, to again, allow marijuana research to, to find a home there at the universities. And it was really contentious. You know, Arizona, very conservative state. There was, it's a very anti-marijuana legislature. So all these folks grandstanding there talking about, I'm not going to support any bill that has the word marijuana in it. And, uh, and there was tons of, you know, fascinating footage that's actually archived in our, um, in our legislature where people are, you know, going off on all kinds of tangents about marijuana, how dangerous it is and why the university should not have a home for it, how it's obviously going to be diverted to students and there'll be rampant marijuana use everywhere. And so, um, but amazingly, that bill passed and, um, and so we managed to find a safe and secure home for, for our study. But before that happened, you know, Rick and I went on an odyssey all around Arizona talking to landlords in the private sector, asking them if they would house our study. And you can't believe, you cannot find a home for this stuff. It is really hard to, to get, because they don't see it as any different than um, than the medical marijuana programs at the state level. And they view, you know, they know, have images of raided dispensaries and they don't want their property involved in that. So it was really tough. So that was a big achievement, getting um, the legislature to back that. And then the other um, huge hurdle we have, of course, is the funding issue. And as Rick alluded to, it is really difficult. If you're trying to do a study on the efficacy of marijuana, it's going to be tough for you to find a, a legit source of funding. If you want to do a study on the harmful side effects of marijuana or the abuse potential of marijuana, you'll probably get you know the green light for funding and study drug and whatever you want. But we chose, our study is looking at combat veterans with PTSD, the, the efficacy and safety of that. And whenever you use the word efficacy, of marijuana, it automatically puts you into kind of a permanent review process with NIDA and the DEA, and it's really difficult to emerge from that. And that's what, you know, our study was approved almost three years ago and still hasn't been allowed to be implemented. So funding, uh, the, one interesting point I want to bring up about funding is there is a potential source of funding through the medical marijuana programs at the state levels, and not a lot of people know that many of these programs run in the surplus. Um, so our program in Arizona, has, it's relatively new. It's only been around uh, two and a half years. It, actually, the dispensaries only got implemented this year, and yet we have a $9 million surplus in our medical marijuana program. And what's fascinating is that that money is voter protected. In Arizona, any ballot initiative, um, that, that money is basically locked and cannot be swept by the legislature. So in some ways, that's really valuable for us, but in um, this crazy situation, that money can't even be touched for marijuana research right now because the language of that ballot initiative said that surplus money can only be used for administration of the medical marijuana program. And the uh, Attorney General and all these folks have decided that that language is too vague to sponsor marijuana research. So it's a really frustrating problem, but I bring it up to you because all of you probably who have medical marijuana laws in your states can find out this is not something they advertise, right? They don't want you to know that there's a surplus, but many of the programs do have it. We dug in there and found it, and, um, and now we are fighting to gain access to that, and we are gonna work very hard. And if we can't get the attorney general or you know, a, a court to approve that usage, we're probably gonna try to write in it. You know, Arizona is going to be one of the states in 2016 that will be pursuing a you know full tax and regulate marijuana system you know but basically replicating the Colorado model and and we hope to have language in our ballot initiative that will clarify this issue make it clear cut so that when there is surplus money that that a portion of that money can be directed into marijuana research and i think that's going to be extremely valuable thank you thank you sir so uh what I'd like to do now is, since these people nicely delineated the problem, I'd like to ask them 
to give me a short sort of um, um, to give some short thoughts on how we can alleviate the problem since we, we do this quite well. We oftentimes lay out a problem, but we, I think we have some smart people here who can help us uh, also answer the problem. But before doing so, I just want to say, as we talk about what happens in research and at various institutions like the 1988 Drug Free Act, we have it at my institution at Columbia uh, with marijuana, but you know, we're allowed to give marijuana in the labs and smoke, but tobacco, that's more difficult. So people are more worried about that at our institution. So it all depends the culture of the institution and uh, when you think about getting funding for these sorts of uh, drugs that we're talking about, it's also important to make sure that you uh, team up with people who have experience and who also have been successful because uh, we certainly figure out a way to, uh, around this at Columbia because there's a lot of money for these institutions who get grants for this kind of work. And believe me, institutions love grant money. So um, there is a way around it. Uh, and with that, I, I just like to ask these folks to give us a quick sort of, some quick thoughts on how we can go about solving this. When I say quick, I mean one or two minutes. Um, <clears throat> some of you have a handout that we made, and this isn't necessarily about uh, funding or about how we get the, um, to, to get more research, but I want to point out that one of the political agendas in this country uh, is to really end public education. Uh, and we see a, a real, uh, a more and more people who don't value science. So I think part of whatever we do has to recognize that, we, that part of our struggle is about persuading people as a matter uh, of culture and, uh, and society that education, in particular science education, matters. One of the things that we're doing that you could really help with is when we see reporting, particularly around pregnant women and the latest alarm around prescription opiate use, right. that you participate in our efforts to w tweet and write to and do social media to the journalists and say, you know, this is, we, we came up with a, I, I don't have the f uh, piece of paper in front of me, maybe somebody else does, but um, uh, a whole lot of wrong was one of the uh, hashtags we were thinking. But when you, for example, read that newborns are, are being born addicted and their mothers are addicting them, well, pregnant women who use opiates or receive methadone or suboxone treatment have newborns that may go through a withdrawal syndrome, but it is completely transitory and treatable and it, the children are not, it is incorrect to use the term addicted newborns. If you're addicted, your mother's done something terrible to you, you're gonna be damaged for life. Every time you see that, do something about it. Write to the journalist, call them out, and provide them with the list of literature we have that's, that provides answers, a, a whole bunch of, uh, we got an expert letter, from leading researchers on the subject of cocaine use during pregnancy, methamphetamine use during pregnancy, opiate use during pregnancy. It's accessible on our website. Send that to them and tell them that they can no longer get away with stigma instead of science, with junk science, that people who use drugs and their children deserve the truth. Thank you, Matt. Well, from, from our perspective, the solution to medical marijuana research is there's a short-term and a long-term solution. The short-term solution right now is that the guidelines that create this review by the Public Health Service, they're only successful in blocking research. They don't provide any value added, and it needs to be completely eliminated. It's something that with um, LSD research, with MDMA research, with psilocybin research, with all other Schedule One drugs, we have to go to the FDA, we have to get institutional review board approval, we have to get approval from DEA, and we have to get approval from state authorities. Only for marijuana is there a special review for medical marijuana protocols. And as I said, that review, their guidelines say that if you want to make marijuana into a medicine, it's not for you. So I think we have to focus pressure through organizing veterans. We now have an FDA and IRB approved study. There's 22 veterans on average every day that kill themselves with suicide, one active duty soldier, it's a national problem, and yet a lot of veterans are using marijuana without any scientific research to suggest how it might be best be used. So we have to really focus political pressure. The important point there is that it does not require an act of Congress, that it's something completely within the purview of the 
President Obama and of the executive branch. They could do it in a stroke of a pen. And they could also order the DEA to give us a license to grow marijuana, which is a lot harder for them to do than actually saying they'll let the research flourish. The other thing internationally is that um, right now in Israel, they're growing, um, they're, they're licensed medical marijuana growers, for-profit growers. And they are growing medical grade. They're moving towards medical grade marijuana that would be acceptable by FDA. So in a couple of years, we'll be able to import marijuana from a foreign country and completely bypass the Public Health Service review. So the long run is really good. The short run, it's hard to say. Uh, the other part is, in terms of funding, and it again links to the, the military in a way, that the work that we're doing with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for veterans is very promising. Uh, last year, the VA spent five and a half billion dollars just on disability payments to about 275,000 veterans. That's an annual cost. It's increasing every year. Five and a half billion dollars, sort of the, the long-term cost of the war. And in order to try to get funding for PTSD research, most of the funding is at the VA and the Department of Defense. And yet, they're, they're uncomfortable formally getting involved in this kind of work. We're doing a study that will be done in about um, two years, and hopefully, once that's done, then there'll be political cover, but we're trying to push that forward uh, sooner. Um, so I, I think those are the solutions, is if we can get some federal funding and get rid of this public health service review, then there's really nothing standing in our way. Um, so I think I definitely agree. I mean, we've certainly created a culture where there is uh, a huge amount of stigma around drug use and drug users. Um, and I think ultimately, um, you know, as I said, I work in primarily a community-based setting, and so for us, it's always, we look at things as, we need this grassroots approach. We have to organize folks. Um, you know, one of the, the main ways to get rid of stigma is through education. Um, and so really until we start tapping in to some folks who currently aren't tapped in and really uh, kind of educating them on, on the reason why we have to do this research, um, I don't think we're going to get very far with that. Um, and then I also think, you know, being a grad student right now, it's just, in my opinion, there's not a whole lot of value placed on people who are thinking outside the box um, as well. You know, we're constantly told about, you know, going back to the research and kind of, you know, you know, looking at um, this kind of research that's out there, but that's really not thinking outside the box. Um, in terms of you know drug use and drug users, so I think you know for me it's just kind of getting to a place where students are encouraged through funding uh, to kind of do some different kinds of research. Um, well, the first thing I, I think I want to say is that we all have to remember that the Nas National Institute of Health and uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse are funded by your taxpaying dollars, um, and I, sometimes I think we forget that. Um, when I talk to people about writing grant proposals or thinking about ideas, you, you have to think about the, who your bosses really are, and that is the taxpayer. Um, and in that sense, I think that one of the things that we really need to do is put pressure on our representatives for the kind of research we really need, that our communities need. You know, don't let the scientists come into your community and design a study without, you know, having some input into how that's what you want to know from that study. And conversely, things like having on the NIDA website that there's no such thing as natural recovery has got to go. Um, I, um, I would bet that there's probably 50% of the audience is naturally recovered from something right now. So that, that's something that we could really move on. And making NIDA stop that, okay? I actually sit on a review uh, panel, so another way to do that is to encourage the people you know who are researchers to sit on these review committees. It's boring, it's, <laughs> it's thankless, but that is one way you really do have some um, influence on, on what kind of research actually gets funded. I did get a, a, a marijuana research project, of course I'm not asking, asking for any drug. I mean, it's an interview project, it's very different, but it took five submissions to get that done. I just was like a little dog with a bone, just coming back, coming back, and finally it got funded. It's very small, it's qualitative, it's certainly not going to, that's the other thing we have to remember too, is that the researchers in this field suffer the same kind of stigma 
um, as our, our participants do. If we, have, we get the reflected stigma that somehow we're not real scientists or, or we're, not as, we're not doing as prestigious work. Well, we have to rely on the taxpayers to demand the kind of research that your community needs, to make, Cong to, to make your co uh, congressman and representative understand that you know that you're paying for all of these grant grants and, and research projects, and that you would like them to really serve your community. Wait, should I? I'm going to have to leave. Can I just? Sure. I'm going to try to make it back, but I do. Are, how many of you uh, are lawyers or work with lawyers? Okay, a lot of you. So the thing I forgot to say is that even when we have limited science, we still have a right in all of our cases, whether they're criminal or civil child welfare, to say that if you are going to make a claim about science or medicine, for example, that the fact that somebody uses a drug means that they can't parent, there are all sorts of legal tools. The requirement that scientific evidence only be admitted if people are qualified experts. Very few lawyers challenge the admission of information by a caseworker or social worker or somebody else and say they cannot testify if they have not themselves done this research or in some other way have the scientific qualifications to testify that we can tell somebody can't parent or they've hurt somebody based on a urine drug test, which does not tell you that. So we have been very fortunate to have Dr. Carl Hart testify, and that's when, when we needed to. To, and to make a difference by saying this is what the science is, but also for all of you who don't have access, there aren't enough Carl Hearts around to go around, but you should be fighting tooth and nail to say nobody should be allowed on a witness stand at a deposition to testify as to a scientific fact until they have established that they are in fact presenting the science. Thank you, Lynn. We'll see you in a bit. Um, just a few ideas to kind of um, add to the conversation. You know, getting funding does help to do research, um, but certainly if you're doing research that is non-paradigmatic, um, well, I, I would just encourage you to continue to challenge the dominant paradigm. And a lot of research will not get funded. Uh, that a lot of good research should should be carried on. Our research that Will Cloud and I did uh, was not funded at the time. We got some small university grants uh, to help defray some of the costs, but it wasn't funded. And you never know uh, what the impact of a good idea will be once it gets out there into the world. And so, uh, you know, some of the things that, that Will and I are proud of is the fact that, the, that some of our work, and there was modest work. I mean, modest is actually to overstate the case, I think, with regards to the the available research on natural recovery. There wasn't much at all. Uh, I mean, we, Sheila and I can name the, you know, on, on, on two hands, the, the number of studies that were available at the time. Uh, but we did it anyways. And one of the terms, one of the concepts that we developed, uh, the concept of recovery capital from our research, we're ha well, I'm very happy to, to have seen that to become integrated in the whole new recovery movement. And so you never know what's gonna happen with, a, with an idea. So I would encourage people to continue to challenge the dominant paradigm, um, even without funding, if it's possible. A couple other ways, too. Can't underestimate the value of education. Um, and that even with uh, the immersion into a dominant paradigm, in this case the disease paradigm, people can come to understand new ways of thinking. And I'm not a social worker, I'm a sociologist, so I sort of stay in the more ethereal world. Well, Cloud, my colleague, is a, is a, a doctor of social work here at the uh, University of Denver, and he's been training for the past 10 years or so now, since we've done this work, a generation of social work students, who many of them came in not having any familiarity with the notion of natural recovery, came in with the kind of immersed into the, the disease concept, who left um, the University of Denver with a, a new appreciation of, again, this more common pathway out of addiction. So I think education um, can, can play a, an enormously important role. And thirdly, I think researchers have to understand, and, and to, to relate to Sh uh, Shakira's point, um, that we have to begin speaking to a non-academic audience. That a lot of what we get, how we get judged by our academic peers um, 
forces researchers to, to place their articles and material into arcane journals that, uh, sad to say, we don't even read, <laughs> let alone uh, non-academic audiences will read. One of the things that my colleague and I, Will, did when we negotiated a contract with uh, NYU Press to publish uh, our book on uh, title Coming Clean, uh, we negotiated with them a second book because we basically said we will write the academic book, we will write the theoretical scholarly book with full of citations and full of the sort of the academic uh, recognition in order to pass promotion and to pass the <laughs> academic standards and so forth and so on. But we would not write that book unless we got a contract to write a second book. And the second book we, did, we, we, we said would not have any citations would not be used the kind of academic language. We would take the experiences of our individuals who engaged in natural recovery and turn it into more of a guidebook uh, that was more accessible. Now the problem is, is that those kinds of non-academic publications don't necessarily get credited within the academic environment, right? So it is difficult for, for young scholars to take these things on, but I think that researchers have to connect more to communities and move outside of their, not only their disciplinary silos, but move out of their institutional locales to work in cooperation, and not just cooperation, partnership with communities um, in order to generate knowledge and then disseminate that knowledge to the constituencies that really matter that can actually take those ideas and put them into action. Um, I just have one tangible uh, proposal that I wanted to throw out. I think um, there is uh, a letter that we sent to Congress that hasn't been signed by anyone yet. And if all you guys would be willing to help us um, what happened was the, the notion that uh, Rick was describing where we would end this, uh, this redundant, unnecessary review by the Public Health Service is so important. If we could overcome that barrier, then we could usher in this whole renaissance of marijuana research in this country. So what happened was we, in Arizona, we met with all of our congressional delegation and, and made the rounds at all the fundraisers and created a pack called Americans for Scientific Freedom to try to, you know, give out money to these folks to see if they would, you know, if they would support this issue. And they all said, absolutely, you write us a check, we'll write us the letter, draft it for us, and we'll sign it. And so not only we sent it to them, we hand carried it to their Washington, D.C. offices, we did everything we could, not a single one of them has signed it. And it is an incredibly well-written letter that was pretty much crafted entirely by Rick. So it's genius, and it is, um, but it is so important if we can overcome this, this barrier. Um, you know, if, if a study, if a marijuana study is approved by the FDA and approved by the university IRB or any private IRB, that that's really should be the gold standard. We don't need a, a third redundant review by PHS and NIDA. So if you guys can help us with that, if there's any way you guys have time after and I can give you my card or you give me your card, I will straight away email you this letter, this draft letter, you can send it to all your congressional delegates and ask them to send it over to um, HHS and let's get this thing moving. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to do, since you all have been sitting so patiently for uh, 50 minutes, I'd like to open it up, uh, ask you guys if you have any questions for the expert panel. Uh, if you would, uh, we are not in the black church, so ask your questions. Make sure it's a question and keep it short. And then, um, we'll start. All right, okay, I'll, I'll keep it moving. So my question has to do about sort of the dominant thing that's sort of washing over a lot of people right now about the, the, the brain disease, the neuroimaging, and all of this. And it's just kind of washing over everyone. And regardless of whether you think there's validity to it or not, in, when something like that happens, do you think that it's better strategically, politically, to work within this sort of emerging paradigm and to kind of go along with it because maybe there's funding there or your university kind of supports that line of thinking? Or if you disagree with it, is it better to kind of keep pushing back against it? Like strategically and politically, what, what are your thoughts on that? 
We only have one mic in this joint. I'm going to get another one. Okay. Uh, anybody particularly? I would push back, but that's just my personality. Um, but, it, but I also think that the neuroscientist um, sort of brain imaging stuff is, um, has enjoyed its run. It's been fashionable for long enough. Um, if I hear one more time about, you know, we, we introduced this drug and it lit up the brain. And then we introduced this drug and it lit up the brain. And then a puppy walked by and it lit up the brain. <laughs> no, I don't, <clears throat> obviously there's a place and there's, there are, are questions that can be answered by such research, but it shouldn't dominate the way it is. So I say push back. Yeah, there, there's a um, few drugs other than MDMA that have been subjected to brain images of holes in the brain and PET scans that show reduced activity. And I think they can be attacked on their own yeah. uh, merits, in a way, or lack of merits. Um, for us, trying to make a drug into a medicine, the FDA wants you to prove safety and efficacy, but you don't have to prove anything about mechanisms of action. So we don't tend to put money in that direction. But the research tends to talk about what happens in the brain, but it doesn't focus that much on functional consequences. Right. So a lot of times, if there's a brain change, it's assumed to be negative, and nobody looks at the next step. So that's one of the main things, is talk about what are the functional consequences, because that's what we really care about. And I, I'll just say that on the NIDA website, there still is this terrific image that was presented by Alan Leshner, who was the head of NIDA, to the Senate committee to pass the Anti-Rape Act. And it's a picture of, um, this healthy brain, the super healthy brain, that's um, baseline brain all lit up as a spec scan, and then it's two weeks after MDMA, and there's a lot of reduced activity. And so it was from a study that he didn't even really fully understand. The study showed that there was no effect of MDMA on blood flow, but there was a temporary dip at two weeks, and then it returned to normal. But what he didn't realize is that in order to be in this study, where people were actually administered scans before and after MDMA, the people had to be heavy ecstasy users just to be in the study. So the baseline brain that he was showing as super healthy was from a heavy ecstasy <laughs> user. So that's why I say we can attack them on their merits. Yeah, when we just start thinking about the brain, uh, I, I hate doing these sort of plugs, but I, I wrote a paper in 2012, Megan, you may know. Uh, it's in neuropsychopharmacology that attacks all of this stuff and it shows people how to evaluate brain imaging and the importance of functional outcomes. It, it's with methamphetamine. We're on the west coast. Uh, well, we're not in California, but in California they think methamphetamine is special, uh, bad being special. Uh, and so uh, if you all are interested in neuropsychopharmacology, uh, you, it shows you how to take apart these brain arguments and it shows you um, how to critically evaluate this information. All right, so uh, we have a lot of questions in the, in the, in the, in the house. Um, if you would, just please keep it short. I'm only going to have one of you guys answer, and keep your answers short. And play nice. Um, Shilly, you answer. Rick, you answer. So the rest of you folks need to answer. Well, my question is for Shilly Borden. Um, you talked a little bit about grassroots research approaches, um, and we've talked a lot about the hard, the hard difficulties getting funding. So I wonder if you could tell us some stories about how working with community has helped to drive the type of questions you're asking in research. Thank you. Um, how it drives the question. So I definitely think that some of the priorities um, for folks in the community, um, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, research questions, um, I guess if you think about the juxtaposition of trying to prove that drugs are bad when perhaps, you know, there's a different story to be told when you take a person's existence using drugs and, you know, remove the whole idea of them being in a vacuum and, oh, it's drugs, they're bad. Um, so I think, you know, when you really get down you know, to the truth of it with people, I mean, you hear what happens every day. I mean, I guess, for example, I mean, we do do um, a bit of syringe exchange. And so talking to people about the methods that they use if they're with someone, you know, who overdoses. So, I mean, I think getting that kind of information directly from people who do it, it helps us to kind of think about the kinds of questions we need, you know, we need to be asking, you know, which really illuminates what a person's 
you know, day-to-day -day existence is like when they're doing this, and not necessarily just, you know, are they quitting or are they going to treatment? I mean, it's much more, you know, it's much deeper than that. You know, I'm thinking about this really in terms of harm reduction as opposed to just, let's just get everybody to treatment that just doesn't work for everyone, so. Thank you, we need to get some questions in the back of bias. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think this mostly is for Mr. Durbin. Um, okay, so you made studying um, psychedelic medicines sound almost easy, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about some of the nuances in getting a project approved. It's easy, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> it is easy, right? Uh, well, it's not easy, but it's, it's not impossible. So I think the, the main challenge is, first off, if you want to do a psychedelic research project, is figure out you know, what's the purpose of it? Um, you know, where's the funding gonna come from? And also the sequencing. So that's one of the more important things is do you go to the FDA first or do you go to the IRB first? The DEA always says that they have to be last. So they don't want to give you any kind of uh, help to get a study done by saying that your security arrangements are fine and the doctor is uh, not gonna divert the drugs. So the DEA always goes last. They also have no timetable on how long they can take to review it. Um, the FDA has to respond within 30 days. So a lot of times it's better to go to the FDA first because they're more science over politics and they will give IRBs courage once the FDA has already said yes. So you have to just think about the sequence. And then the easy part about psychedelic research is that for us it's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So it's not a take home drug. It's always administered under supervision of the therapist. So there's no risks of drug diversion like there are in other drugs, like there are in our marijuana study. That's a big issue because we're gonna have people take weak supply and do it at home. And so how do we control that? We've had to have people um, photograph, we give everybody cameras and they have to photograph themselves taking out of the box box and using it every day and putting the stuff back in just to make sure that there's no drug diversion of this little bit of marijuana. So I, I think that you have to really focus on the methodology. The most important thing is focus on the scientific methodology and make it as rigorous as you can, as independent raters, and, and then it'll come through. Well, back to the back. Hi, I'm gonna ask a question about an article I can't cite. I saw it right up my way out here and I can't pull up the internet but it was a researcher who was trying to find how we come up with this to or toxic dose of nicotine. And he, he, it kept being cited in the literature. It was accepted at four milligrams, and he couldn't figure out where it came from. Turns out, it goes all the way back to like the 1920s. It's two researchers who experimented on themselves and came up with that number, made themselves very sick, and that was the number for that dose. And there was no, you know, nothing between then and now that made that a fact, that, you know, is that a question? That a I'm question? asking, okay, so since there, you know, since we have um, things that are accepted as fact, how far back do we as responsible researchers have to go to verify that these things in the literature are indeed true? I'm going to ask a couple questions before running back up there. Uh, question, so um, think about who will answer that question, how far should you go back in your research, um, and other questions. We have only women who are asking questions. Um, I understand that we'd all rather have a situation where uh, research could be funded and in the positive. Um, but in the but everything if everything if all the research grants have been funded looking at negative questions and and we still found things like you know, marijuana is not increasing the incidence of cancer or sometimes lowers it in some cases. Um, why don't, and I apologize if this is a very stupid question, but why don't we phrase more questions in the negative? Like saying, like looking for negative things, but we know we're going to disprove it anyway. Is it because nobody's going to buy that Rick Doblin would ever put in something like that? Or, or is it you're not, you don't think you're going to find the results you're going to get to? So we have two questions. Um, can we answer the first question, how far do we need to go back uh, as researchers? Uh, we have two microphones up there. Well, the question is, to answer the question quickly, 
you have to go back as far as relevant as it is. I mean, as far as you, you can where there's good science, uh, you, you go back. Sometimes that means you go back to uh, 2010. Sometimes it means that you go back to 1910. It depends what the question is, uh, the amount of research that has been done in that area. So it, it, it varies. Rick? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say about the um, phrasing things in the negative that sometimes that's the only strategy that works, and we have done that. And we worked with Donald Abrams in 1992 to start getting a study for marijuana for AIDS wasting and nausea control. And we had FDA approval, IRB approval, and NIDA refused to sell us the marijuana. Then Prop 215 happened um, in 1996, and NIDA was feeling like, because they were blocking research that would foster other state uh, medical marijuana initiatives, so they actually contacted Donald and said that now if you can phrase it in the negative, we might be willing to support it. And so protease inhibitors had just come in. So the idea was then to look at the negative effects of marijuana in patients with AIDS wasting who are taking protease inhibitors. But what they did say is that we couldn't look at AIDS wasting. It had to be only people that had HIV but had not AIDS wasting. So that it proved safety, it showed that they did get uh, appetite increased, weight gain, and there were no negative interactions. So sometimes it works, but if you want to develop a drug into a medicine, you need the positive side. So you can only go so far with that kind of strategy. And also, related to that question, um, I've been studying methamphetamine and showing the benefits of methamphetamine. Uh, but my grants don't look for the benefits of methamphetamine. It, it starts out looking for some way to deal with people uh, problems related to methamphetamine. Turns out you find all these beneficial effects and if you look at the literature you will see a lot of beneficial effects that are not commented on by, by the researchers. So as was pointed out earlier, nobody really wants to read this boring literature but if you actually go and look at the data, the data will support many of the positions that you all hold. So you don't need to read what people say because oftentimes it's rubbish. What you want to look at is the actual data. And the data will set you free. <laughs> Other questions? I'll come over to you guys in a second. Hi. Um, some comments. Uh, first of all, oh, no, question. <laughs> question. I'm the editor of the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse, and I would I would welcome, let me, um, how to phrase this in a question? Oh, right, right, right. Um, I, we, would, we would welcome um, manuscripts that are negative, or, or what was said, pointing out the opposite of what one might expect. Right on. So, yeah. what's your name? Brian Adenoff. Brian Adenoff, an editor here of one of the journals that we care about. If you've got something that needs to be published, Talk to Brian, he's right here. Normally these people don't identify themselves because they don't want to be inundated with requests, but thank you, Brian. Yeah, hi, uh, my question is for Rick. Uh, Rick, is, do you know of anybody who's, any researcher, who's interested in researching cannabis in the United States who's gone to the Dutch Health Ministry for research grade product? Yeah, we've tried that. So Petrocan is the company that's approved by uh, the Netherlands to sell through their pharmacies. But in order for us to use their marijuana in the United States, the company has to open up a drug master file at the FDA. So the FDA agrees that their marijuana is medical grade, and they have refused, Bedrocan has decided not to do that. So we cannot import from the Netherlands, even though they have medical grade marijuana, because the company has not opened up a drug master file at the FDA. And maybe the Dutch government doesn't want to piss off the U.S. government by breaking the block on marijuana research. That's one possible explanation. The other is GW Pharmaceuticals, which is in England that manufactures Sativex, and they have medical grade marijuana, then they extract the cannabinoids. But they don't want any studies that would compare the plant to their product, because the plant smoked or vaporized would probably outcompete in most patients' views. So there are no places that we can import into the United States at this point. Well, the, the FDA requires that any research that you do is done with a product that's medical grade, that's standardized, reliable. And so it, it's, once that has been established, if 
let's say an Israeli company two years from now opens up a drug master file with the FDA, then their marijuana can be used by independent researchers, it can be used by sponsors to make it into a prescription medicine, any of all of, the, all of these options are available. But um, the FDA has to accept the drug first. And they've done that for LSD, MDMA, we have all of that already done, just not marijuana. Um, hello, my name is Ciara. Um, I study amphetamine. Um, and everybody's talking about negative and positive effects. Um, I have some data that is neither positive or negative. Does anybody have any suggestions on how um, to deal with that data and get it out there, where kind of nothing happens when you're studying a drug? What do you mean it's not positive or negative? <laughs> so, Ciara, you mean that uh, you gave a drug, for example. Yeah. If you give a drug, and you have, you have some effect. For example, if you give methamphetamine to an animal, you increase locomotor activity, but you didn't see toxicity that you thought you'd see at that dose. Yep. And so that's the negative effects that you're talking about. That's what would be called negative. Then right. you have the positive, like it increases concentration or something. But what if you give the drug and nothing really happens in the measures that you're looking at? So how do you suggest that that data becomes publishable? if nothing is happening after drug treatment? Well, uh, that's a, maybe we should talk about that afterwards because then <laughs> there, are some, uh, there are some issues that will, maybe you don't have the right dose. To, uh, if nothing is, is happening, uh, maybe there's something wrong with the experimental design. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons for nothing's happening. And so it, it might be nothing's happening because nothing's there or it could be something wrong with your experimental methodology. And but we'll have to tease that apart. Uh, beyond the scope of our talk here. Hi, um, I was wondering from, and this is from a New Zealand perspective, where you can in theory obtain a research license to research new psychoactive substances. Actually nobody has, and all the research that's done is more like industrial R&D than sort of uh, clinical research at this stage. But I was wondering if uh, there were similar, you described there was obstacles to research using controlled drugs in the US. I was wondering if there were similar obstacles to research involving new psychoactive substances. Well, the, the main one there is financial, so we're not that interested in what new psychedelics are developed. Because right now, if you put MDMA or ecstasy in Medline, there's over 3,500 papers. So if we had, were to start with a new drug, even if we could patent it, the amount of money that we'd have to spend on the safety and the toxicity studies is beyond the capacity that we have available. So that's why we want demonized drugs. And because of the enormous body of research that already exists. And we are doing a study in New Zealand, by the way, which is um, Ibogaine in the treatment of addiction. And so what we're doing is an observational study at a clinic in New Zealand that's legally able to administer Ibogaine to opiate addicts. Alex. Uh, thank you. My question is to Professor Granfield, and particularly directed to your comments about um, research and approaches in Singapore. Uh, and I think your comments are correct that um, there are similarities uh, similar discrepancies in the way research is conducted in the US and abroad. But I put to you that Singapore is really not a good example. It's very extreme in terms of the rest of the world. And uh, it, there's certainly no level playing field in the rest of the world, but the, the uh, extremes of the um, distortion of research in the United States are so much more severe in the rest of the world, there really is no comparison. This is the belly of the beast. Um, can I make two quick comments, if I may? One is that I think it would be very helpful to, uh, for somebody to get together uh, a very comprehensive documentation of all the problems with uh, scientific research in the drugs area, especially in the United States. And maybe the way to do that, maybe this is beyond any one person, maybe this would be a series of papers in a, specific, uh, in a special edition of a journal, for example. Um, and I think that would be very helpful. Starting with uh, renaming, uh, suggestion, starting with renaming NIDA. I mean, why should it be called NIDA? And why should it have that mission statement? Final suggestion is that I think one of the most insidious um, and important uh, um, and bizarre ways of um, this whole field is turned upside down is the way outcomes in this area clinical outcomes and clinical intervention research are so often measured categorically rather than dimensionally. Sorry for the language, but to explain that, 
uh, is the person abstinent or not abstinent, that's the only question, rather than whether the person is uh, healthy and socially functioning, measured in a uh, mild, moderate, severe scale, uh, which is from a human viewpoint and from a clinical viewpoint in every other field of medicine, the only thing that really matters. Well, let me see. So you know we just strive to rename NIDA. You do know that, right? Yeah, we just had this sort of couple year long um, uh, discussion about renaming NIDA and merging NIDA with the National Institute of Alcohol. And they were going to rename it, and uh, that was a disaster. And they didn't go in the direction that we thought they would, we would want them to go. Instead, they expanded it to make everything Pathology. Yeah. So that, 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 I don't know how that will work. And what, wasn't it substance? With, with, it was I forget. There was some long. Institute of Substance Abuse. Yes, it, it was something. The umbrella got even. Right, and then also this issue of why do we have this sort of all or none thing? Are you clean or are you abstinent? In part because of the dogma that many of you all have, in that when we are in these meetings, people stand up and say they are ten years clean. 20 years clean, like as a, a badge of moral sort of superiority. Um, those, that, that's part of the problem, and the, the, the sort of problem that uh, the, the alcohol sort of industry has had, or the alcohol anonymous sort of industry has had, uh, the, their influence in this field. So uh, uh, it's not only night in that regard, it's for many of us in that regard. So we have to be re-educated, and we have to think differently about those things. Um, I'm wondering about sort of our bias that it's really academic institutions that have to do a lot of the research. And so I'm happy to hear a nonprofit, but that's more, um, you know, seems pharmaceutically based, as you're saying. What about the social science research and nonprofits who actually are really more community based often have those constituents, but it's so hard to get funding for nonprofits to do research because it's like, well, you're not real researchers, even if you are, have been academically trained. Okay. Anybody have any suggestions? So, I'm sorry, what was the question about it? How can we um, create funding and more support for nonprofits to be <clears throat> conducting social science research? Yeah. Um, and I would say for Women with a Vision, which is the organization we work with, um, I think we rant about this all the time because a lot of the work we do is also uh, like social justice based human rights work, um, a lot of advocacy. And so what you find, particularly when you're dealing with foundation funding, is a lot of them don't even want to touch research, right? Um, I don't know the answer. Honestly, haven't figured it out yet. I think that um, for us, we will sometimes do projects regardless of whether or not we're funded. And it's just what we do. I mean, for me, I don't know that I'll ever you know, be that person who's just in academia. I mean, my heart is really in community-based work. So. Sometimes you partner, and you know that's the other thing. So looking at those kinds of academic community partnerships, which can go very right or very wrong. But I think as long as the community-based partner um, is somewhat savvy about it um, and sticks up for the community-based point of view, I think those can can work out. So at this point, I'm going to ask folks to uh, give closing remarks because we only have a few minutes left. So, Sue, so would, would you like to start? Uh, uh, give us a minute of closing remarks. Um, I would just say, I think that the NIDA monopoly is um, really being, become so problematic at this point that we've decided to look at other options until we can overcome that by um, doing just strictly observational studies on folks. We have a, some really robust medical marijuana programs at the state levels that are you know, we can collect data on the cardholders, and I think that's where we're headed. We're going to try to accumulate as much data as possible to try to persuade NIDA to look at these numbers and use that as a lobbying tool. Um, I really want to encourage all of you who, who are willing to forward that letter to your congressional delegation to come find me after, please. We desperately need your help. If everyone in the room would send it to their congressman, we could possibly overturn this problem. So thank you again. I should say something before we finish. Uh, I am on NIDA's council. That's their highest board. So when we talk about NIDA, you can bring these comments to me as well. So um, um, I have some influence. <laughs> I guess the last thing I, would, I say is maybe in, in uh, response to the last, last question. It is the case that uh, more funding agencies 
are increasingly requiring um, uh, academic researchers to partner and to uh, have the voice of the community. So I think that there are avenues and openings there uh, for these partnerships, particularly if you develop relationships with the community, if you are the academic or academics uh, developing relationships uh, with the community. Do you also, you know, are you at a university, an uh, academic institution? I have been. You have been. So, so you also have to understand that, that universities have their own money as well. It's not necessarily as large as a you know, federal grant. But uh, one of the things that I've done at the University of Buffalo has been to initiate um, a, an, an initiative uh, in civic engagement and public policy where we have a small pool of money where we're able to fund researchers, but the requirement is that it be community-based research and the proposals have to demonstrate uh, a clear partnership with community and not just a name only, but a partnership across the whole research um, you know, panoply that uh, that in order to get this, these few thousands of dollars, uh, and I'm amazed at what people have been able to to do with a few thousand dollars. The research has been tremendous, uh, but universities can uh, can you can leverage that money from from the universities. Um, and again, if there's more of encouragement to support community-based uh, research, that could be one avenue for funding. Um, okay, well, one of the things that I've been thinking about is the fact that we're seeing a huge, obviously, sea change in marijuana policy. Um, and one of the things about NIDA is NIDA's going to be very vulnerable because you realize the, dr the drug that people use in the United States is marijuana. Right? So, NIDA's raison d'etre is in danger. Right? Why would, you don't think so? Of course not. Uh, the, the focus now will be on uh, the dangers of marijuana uh, in young people and brain development. Well, no, I'm not saying that they don't can't pivot. Uh, that's not. No, they have pivoted. I'm yeah. telling you, don't be, don't get it twisted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But we can influence that. I mean, it is a of period course. of change. Of course. It is a, and, of course. And since you're so in influential. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but the point I'm trying to make is it is a period of flux, and we know historically that this is the time where we can where we can have some influence. Um, NIDA is going to have to change. The world is changing around them. I'm telling. You agree with that? I am telling you how NIDA has changed, right. and, and I just want to make sure people understand. You know, it's like we are in a moment that's absolutely bright. But don't get it twisted. They have already changed, and the focus now is on the pathology associated with these states that have new marijuana policies. They will find damage, harm to young people in those states. That's where the pivot has happened. That is sad, that is, but that's the reality. And so we have to make sure that we are operating uh, uh, with knowledge that, that they have already made the shift and we have to be prepared. <laughs> we have five minutes left, and so we are just... Um, so I guess the last thing I'll say is uh, I have a chairing section I was telling you to mention. I guess when it comes to doing these kinds of academic community partnerships, you know, again, it's extremely important to have folks involved from every stage, from design to dissemination. But, you know, an, an example of that is, you know, for women with a vision, we try to make sure if we're working with people on research that, you know, we're listed as co-PIs on their, on their research. Well, I got two points. The first is that I think that the um, struggle to liberate NIDA marijuana and have privately funded drug development research is winnable. I think ending this public health service review is something that, Carly, you could have help with various people in Congress. I think it's a winnable fight. The, the other thing to say is that the idea of developing drugs into medicines provides another funding source as well. So what the FDA has set up, which I didn't realize Congress created this, is that if you develop a drug that's off patent, that there's no use patents, but you're the first to make the molecule into a medicine, you have five years what's called data exclusivity, which means nobody can use your data to apply to get a generic drug. They can replicate the research, but it'll take them at least five years. So what we're looking at at MAPS is that if we're the first to make MDMA into a medicine, and it's Hefter Research is the first to make psilocybin into a medicine. The big vision is that then we have this period where we are the only sponsors selling the drug. And then with the income that comes from that,
we can fund further research. So we're talking now about a sustainable nonprofit with requiring roughly $20 million over about eight years in order to do all the research, but then once that research is done, we have products for sale that will then generate income to continue the research going. Man, okay. Are you going to be Big Pharma? What? Are you going to be Big Pharma? We hope so. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, non profit. Okay. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, make an announcement for Saturday, October 26th. The Veterans for Medical Marijuana Act, uh, Mer Medical Cannabis Access will be um, having uh, a support group uh, in Plaza Court, Court 6 from 1 30 to 3 o'clock. So if you could check that out. And I just want to thank you all for being a great audience. And I want to just give a round of applause to our excellent. Thank you, guys.